can confirm that 26 men and women from Great Britain and Ireland have broken two world records for the highest games of contact and non-contact rugby ever played. An expedition featuring former internationals Shane Williams, Lee Mears, Ollie Phillips, Tamara Taylor, as well as 22 brave challengers, climbed 6,500 metres up the world's tallest mountain, Mount Everest, to successfully complete a challenge that pushed them to their physical and emotional limits, all to raise money for charity. 26 challengers, a year of preparation, a journey into the unknown. In April 2019, a group of strangers came together to undertake an adventure in one of the most inhospitable places in the world. When you're on that mountain, it's your own head that's going to get you up there. 90% of success is showing up, and it's going to be showing up in your head. The body will go farther than you ever think is possible. Overcoming some of life's biggest challenges how lucky am I to be the age of 43 when so many children don't make it? My nephew Toti, who uh, died very quickly of cancer aged 11, and always sort of inspired me on to do these things. And it's in his memory, really, that, that I do this challenge. Uniting in the face of severe fatigue. You just kind of put your head down, and whether it hurt or whether you couldn't breathe or whether you doubted yourself, you just had to carry on. There were times on the walk when I thought, this is bonkers. The air was getting thinner. Each step we were taking was getting harder and harder. It was mentally tough, as well as physically tough. Pushing their bodies to the very limit. We were told by the doctor that after five and a half thousand meters, your body doesn't adapt and you're just dying, really. And it's hard, 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 and gets harder and harder the higher you go. Beating all the odds to make history in the Himalayas. The fact that we're going up to set a Guinness World Record and to play the highest game of rugby ever played in history, two of them, touch and contact, adds a lot more incentive to it, a lot more reward to it all, but equally makes it so much more challenging because there's a reason why it's never been done before, and that's because it's seriously tough and it's going to be a really hard challenge. Whoever you are, wherever you are, the word Everest evokes an image. The thought of a mountain standing above all others, one of Earth's greatest challenges. At the height of 8,848 metres, the mountain was first declared the world's highest peak in 1841 by land surveyor Sir George Everest. Mountaineers from all over have tried to stand on top of the world since the early 1920s, with Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay first achieving the feat on the 29th of May 1953. In the 66 years since, only approximately 11% of summit attempts have ended in success, with the mountain claiming more than 300 lives. With less than a third of the equivalent breathable oxygen of sea level, extreme altitude sickness and exhaustion make climbing the mountain one of the hardest things even an experienced mountaineer can do. So for the 26 inexperienced men and women of varying ages and backgrounds, reaching advanced base camp 6,500 metres up the north side of the mountain was going to take an extraordinary level of commitment and determination. Spearheading the group are four former international players, including legendary Welsh winger Shane Williams. What I love about the challenge is the fact you're doing something out of your comfort zone. When I retired, I didn't really have anything that I could set my mind to that, that I felt was a challenge. And the first thing I did was the London Marathon. Now, that was really tough because I've, I'm a sprinter having to change my whole dynamics and my training to try and run 26.2 miles. After that, I did an Ironman. Now, that nearly killed me. But I'm always looking for something bigger and better again. And, you know, I seem to have this progression where I've been testing myself now for a couple of years. But doing Everest is definitely the pinnacle of my challenges so far. So I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, I can be mentally and physically ready. A lot of aspects are similar to rugby, I'd say. The fact that we're a team is very much similar to playing rugby. Getting to the top as well, we're all going to stick together. We're going to help each other out when the going gets tough. So I'd like to think that all the values that rugby brings are going to be needed on this trek. The challenges don't come much tougher mentally or physically. You know, I've certainly seen enough documentaries and, and TV programs and films, as far-fetched as they are, obviously, to know that it, it can be quite a dangerous trek, of course. But what comes with danger is excitement. You know, I'm looking forward to it, excited, 
a little bit nervous, not as nervous as my wife. She keeps reminding me that she's not sure if it's a good idea. When you have your own children and family, you know, I, th I suppose the importance of charities like a wooden spoon come forward and prove to you really that I'm very lucky. We're all healthy and happy here in this family, and that makes me even more determined to help others out. There's a lot of families out there that aren't as fortunate as me, certainly a lot of children that unfortunately are very poorly, and that's a huge factor in why I want to do this. I'm very lucky in that I've had a, a good career in rugby, but I appreciate as well that people aren't as fortunate, so um, that's why I do these. Like many of life's greatest achievements, the Everest Rugby Challenge rose from humble beginnings, with the group first meeting in the autumn of 2018 to become the latest participants in Wooden Spoon's rich history of challenges. Your journey will take you to Advanced Base Camp, which is at 6,300 metres, uh, and the games, as I say, will be a little bit higher than that, probably around 6,500 metres, which is very, very high. So that's over 20,000 feet. Wooden Spoon have always been involved in, in challenges and uh, playing rugby in unusual places. In 2015, we took a team of intrepid explorers to the North Pole to play rugby. This time, we want to be bigger and better. There are a number of things we could have done. We could have paddled the Amazon crossed Africa, played on the equator, played the hottest game, the coldest game. But I think the uh, obvious answer is always going to be, let's play the highest game. So let's find out. Where was the highest game of rugby ever played? Steve Prescott, the foundation, played at uh, just over 6,000 metres. We need to play a bit higher, so we're going to play rugby on Everest. We're based here in the Lake District. The Lake District's really good for getting out in the hills and it allows us just to give everyone a bit of an, an eye-opener of what being out in the hills is like. Altitude is probably the scariest part for everyone because they don't know how they're going to actually react at altitude. And there's lots of ways that we can manage that. There's lots of things that we can do to help the programme set up in a way that, you know, the acclimatisation progress is, is very slow and steady. We always have lots of different characters. We have people from all over on our expeditions usually, and at the end of the day, it's a great leveller, you know. Everybody's going to be doing the same thing once they get there. It was interesting because uh, when a lot of new people often get together, it's often a bit cagey where people are weighing each other up and trying to see who's who and, you know, if there's any agendas, that sort of stuff, any egos that need to be managed. Thankfully, there was none. We actually bonded very, very fast. I was sat in the briefing room with the 25, 30 challengers that are here on this training weekend. As they came out of the briefing room, you know, some of the guys came, uh, saying, it's all becoming a little bit real now, isn't it, Matt? I said, too right, it's getting exciting, isn't it? It's been a lot of hard work getting to this point. You know, just like with every challenge, getting to the start line is often the hardest thing to do. But I think we're well on the way, and this is going to be such an amazing experience. First day was really, really long. I haven't done a lot of walking, so it was good to get out and be on my feet for that amount of time, because you might say that someone who plays rugby, oh, they're really fit, like it'll be easy, but it's a completely different kind of fitness to be constantly on your feet and constantly on the move walking. There are challenges ahead of us. We suddenly begin to realise what some of the logistical challenges are going to be for us to set up a rugby pitch on the side of Everest, underneath the North Col. How are we going to mark out the lines? How are we going to put up the posts? How are we going to get flags up there? How's the ball going to get up there? How, uh, you know, will the ball self-inflate? Do we need to pump it up? Will it pump itself up? There's lots of things to think about still. So it's a lot of hard work still to come, but to get 25 people together, all keen and ready to go and prepared to put themselves on the line, put their bodies on the line to make a difference, that's a huge step. We've just got a number of other big steps to overcome as well. One of the other team captains is England's second most capped player of all time, Tamara Taylor. The 37-year-old second row earned 115 caps for her country and combines her role as a player with coaching and has a long association with the wooden spoon. If someone says you've got an opportunity to go somewhere like Mount Everest, it's probably only going to happen once in your life. So I felt like it was an opportunity that I couldn't really turn down. I've worked alongside the charity Wooden Spoon for quite a long time as an ambassador, and I love what they do. And to be able to do something a little bit crazy and scary um, on their behalf to raise money was also like a no-brainer, really, for me. 
the projects that I've been to. They're all so different, but they all make such a huge impact on the area that they're in because they're chosen specifically for that area or for that school or, or you know, that organisation. It's just amazing to be able to see literally where the money that you're raising has gone and the people that it's helping. When I got the call from Matt, I was in and around finishing playing a bit of rugby, had an ankle reconstruction and was feeling pretty sad. So having something where I knew I was going to have to work really hard to raise the sponsorship money and the fundraising, be scared, be challenged in a different way, it gave me something to kind of take my mind off reality. I think for me it's going to be quite a, a journey of how I interact with other people from different backgrounds and I think just having that time away from everything that I've been doing, it's probably either going to break me because I'm going to be spending so much time thinking about it or it'll make me because I'll actually figure myself out and sort out what's next. But whilst Taylor has overcome all that's lay before her on the rugby field, mountains provide an altogether more intimidating challenge. That's definitely my biggest worry, is that I'm not going to be able to complete the challenge because I get sick. But there isn't a lot you can do apart from, you know, go steady away and, and try and make yourself as, as best prepared as you can before you go. I think probably as a sports person who tries to control the controllables, it's quite scary to not be able to control how your body might react to something. And without really any way of knowing until you're up there, um, and then when you're up there it's a bit late. So I think I'd be lying if I said um, I wasn't worried, and that's definitely my biggest concern about the challenge is how I'm going to react to the lack of air. Well, there'll be air, but not enough oxygen. With the preparations continuing, the group reassembled in the coastal city of Southampton for a series of tests, team selection and all-important bonding time. We've taken the guys through a series of health tests, so some really basic but really important tests that need to be done before going to altitude. So taking a look at their blood pressure, their lung function, and then tested them actually at altitude. So we tested at 4,000 metres and at 5,000 metres and seeing how they respond to the lack of oxygen in the air to give us a bit of an idea of how they're going to respond when they actually go to high altitude. You might go to altitude and just experience shortness of breath, mild headache, and it's unlikely that people would go to altitude and not experience anything like that. Kind of going up from there a little bit, you're starting to look at symptoms like nausea and possibly going on towards vomiting. And those kind of symptoms, whilst they sound pretty unpleasant, are not uncommon if people haven't prepared particularly well because there are a lot of factors that feed into altitude sickness. So the lack of oxygen is one thing, but then also things like dehydration, poor nutrition, that kind of thing can also feed in. What's a little bit more serious then is if you're moving on to symptoms beyond that and you're not taking care of that and actually start getting edema either on the brain or, or on the lung, so fluid on the brain, fluid on the lung, which is a little bit more serious. And that's what, what you need to be preventing. It's funny, when you talk to people about what you're doing, it's kind of the first thing they say. They don't say, oh, how fit are you getting for it or how many hours of walking have you done? But the first thing they say is, well, how are you going to manage with the altitude? And I've never been in that high. So, yeah, definitely that's been the fear, especially when people say, you don't know how you're going to respond and, and they start explaining what altitude sickness actually is. It's, uh, it starts to get a bit scary. With the testing complete, it was time for the fleece presentation, where the challengers found out not only who was going to be their captain, but also friend from four, in a rugby sense anyway. Finding out whose team we were in, I mean, that was quite exciting. You feel like that day at school when you're being picked for the team. It's exciting for people to know who they're going to be playing alongside and, and what they're going to have to do, whether they're up there. At the same time, you know, it all kicks in. We've been talking about it a lot, but all of a sudden, you're in a team and you're going to have to go on Everest and play a rugby match, which is bizarre, really, when you talk about it. So I think it's set in home now that we've got a massive challenge ahead of us, but at the same time, it's more exciting. Should be one of those in focus. Cheers. <laughs> With just three months until the start of the expedition, the group gathered one final time to test themselves in some of the United Kingdom's most extreme conditions. The minute New Year came and you look at what you've got coming up in the year and you got the Everest challenge, it became very real very quickly. I think the bonding has been fantastic really from the start, but when you're out there on the mountain and it's cold and wet and you start to fatigue, I think it's quite interesting to see how the group interacts with each other. So I think that bonding that we have now 
I think it's really going to come to the forefront when we're out there doing the challenge. The plan today was that we wanted to have a bit of a test for everybody. Not only is it important that we come up to Glencoe, to up into the sort of highlands of Scotland, to have a bit of team building, but it's also important that we get out and just experience a little bit of how we're going to manage ourselves on the mountain and deal with things like the cold and boot management, kit management, all that sort of stuff. As you can see behind, there's some decent snow up on the hills. So that was a good, good test for everybody. The group dynamics are very good, especially when conditions get really rubbish. It's nice to see a bit of joking still going on. It's a little bit harder for Robin because his little legs are going to go twice the distance, eh? You've got to be used to this, though. This is surely a familiar situation. Snow White in front, one of the dwarfs falling behind. No? Ho, 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 ho. And nice to see as well that the newer members coming into the team felt part of it. And I think because the other team members are strong now together, it was really easy to welcome new people into the team and to make them accepted. We've got to keep going well. over another false summit. <laughs> it really is an easy one, and it is cold. Probably the most realistic training we've done so far. I'm sure this Everest will be like this hill on steroids, but definitely join ourselves today. I think the emotions go from kind of bravado to slight scared and nervousness. And a few times I've kind of found myself lying awake at night thinking of actually what it really means. So I think excitement is still there, but it's, it's being replaced by realisation that this is actually a big challenge. And it is definitely scary. But I, in some ways that's also a good part of it because it's part of what that challenge is. It's that feeling in the pit of your stomach, you're quite unsure about what's going to happen. And I get a small glimmer of what some of these expeditionists, you know, the Chris Bonningtons and the Randall Fines and all those, just a tiny, tiny feeling of what maybe they've experienced of something that you're really not sure what's going to happen. And it's the in, into that kind of unknown. And I guess that's what makes you feel a bit alive, doesn't it? You know, that, that trepidation. For each of the 26, Everest presents a unique experience. But for some, the strength and resolve to overcome such a big challenge is driven from some of life's greatest adversities. I'm Jude, I'm 43, and I'm mother to Archie, my deceased son, Jack, and my youngest son, Toby, and have been involved with Wooden Spoon for about eight years now. My boys have played rugby. They were playing for Bishop Stortford Rugby Club and I played hockey back in the day. But with a grueling work schedule, I stopped playing sport for about 20 years. And then moving out of the city, there's an opportunity for more time, you can commit more to a team. There's some flyers being handed out around the sides of the pitch while I was watching my boys and I just went, ah. Oh. How amazing, I want to do that. So I turned up to practice um, at the age of 42 last year, but I was just hungry for more and hooked. I didn't think I'd love it so much, but in terms of the physicality and just being part of the team and just meeting girls that you probably would never have met, different walks of life, doesn't matter who you are. So I really love that aspect of it. They're getting behind me on this, and that support is just fantastic. So the next natural progression after saying one season of rugby, of course, was to play it on Everest. Why not? <laughs> Go, Georgia! I've been through quite significant challenges. The biggest challenge is emotional, where my middle son died in 2004. After Jack, one of the big challenges I still face, actually, is, you know, learning how to live and on a daily basis and how can you ever laugh again, how can you ever um, eat, any, you know, just go about your, about your life when something like this has happened. Um, and I think what you eventually um, get is, you know, we... We're not on this earth a long time, and every day is a blessing. You know, how lucky am I to be the age of 43 when so many children don't make it through life at all? So in terms of being able to give and help and make 
lives of these kids a little bit better. I just get an extreme sense of gratitude, really, how lucky we are to be in this position and use that to help other people that need it. With months of physical and emotional preparation complete, the final group of 26 men and women assembled for a fitting send-off for a journey into the unknown. It probably didn't hit me really that, um, that we were going and setting off until I got to the airport with my bags, saw everyone in there all in our matching tops. Um, and it was then that I thought, right, we're actually going to Mount Everest now. You will be a formidable force. You will achieve everything that you desire and everything you deserve. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Stay safe, look after each other. Now, just go daily. With the expedition finally underway, the team traveled for two days to reach the Tibetan city of Lhasa, the capital provided the group with the last opportunity to ensure they had everything they needed to survive the journey ahead. So today we're going in to do the kit checks for everyone. It's essential that we've got the equipment on the mountain because this is the last place we'll probably be able to buy any of the equipment that they've, they've forgotten or we've uh, left in the other hotel rooms perhaps. So um, it's the essential kit that are, that's the main things like survival blankets, big down jackets, the equipment that's going to keep everyone warm and safe on the mountain. So, that. Is your waterproof? Good. Yeah. yeah. These, these trousers. Are, are, are your not your waterproof? I'm the, not my waterproof trousers, yes. yes. But right. it doesn't rain here, so we're okay, right? It snows. Mm, I'd like to see your waterproof trousers, though. <laughs> I don't have any waterproof trousers. Okay, so there's somebody we're going this afternoon to buy waterproof trousers for. Are we surprised? <laughs> Next bit. Jude and I are going uh, men and women waterproof trouser shopping in Lhasa because otherwise we're probably going to get very wet. Waterproof trousers. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it turns out that they don't have waterproof trousers. Um, glad we established that. Well, so that wasn't that wasn't very successful, but I think we're going to go this way now. Altitude affecting me. Ugh. Yeah, perfect. Considering I've got considering I've got quite a lot of stuff in my pockets. 310? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, mission successful. Victory! <laughs> With the final details sorted, the team set off on a four-day journey to finally arrive at Everest Base Camp, but not before getting a brief sample of what awaited them in their world record attempts. We had a couple of stop-offs on the way because we've, we've gone up quite a height. So we stopped off at a really nice lake where we're quite a bit above it, so we're looking down onto it and there's a big car park area. So obviously a scrum came out, there's a bit of a bit of competition there, just practicing ready for the sevens game. A couple of line-outs, so myself and Jess decided that we'd lift Carrie um, because she's about this big. Gave her a couple of line-out goes, Shane Williams. Then got himself involved. He's probably not a natural uh, line-out jumper. Wasn't that happy in the air. And then we decided we'd have a really quick go of uh, five-a-side touch. Genuinely probably lasted about maximum a minute. And uh, a couple of us checked our heart rates and everyone's hearts were beating out of their chest. Um, it was fun, but I think it was also made everyone a little bit of a reminder in the back of their heads that this isn't going to be an ordinary game of rugby that people are used to. And competition's going to be high, but actually our ability levels are going to be quite low. So um, a few more of them and I think we'll be, we'll be prepped and ready. The group gained over 1,600 metres in altitude in just four days. To put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of roughly three and a half Empire State buildings stood one on top of the other, with the effective amount of breathable oxygen in the air being approximately half of that at sea level. Little wonder then that some members of the group soon started to struggle. Shortage of breath, headache, which has kind of been there for a while, but you kind of get on with it. And, um, yeah, little bits of tingling here and there, and suddenly sort of, 
catching up with your breath as well. But the best thing for morale was the thought of finally seeing the mountain the group are attempting to climb. If only the weather would be so kind. We are at the top of a big hill, which supposedly gives us a view of the five highest peaks in the Himalayas. Unfortunately today, we're lacking a little bit of luck, which means we can't see them. It's a shame, is it? We should have been able to see it yesterday. It's basically teasing us. We're so close to seeing Everest, but we haven't seen it yet. And as the team made their approach towards base camp, they finally saw what's known locally as Mount Chumalunga, but globally, simply Everest. I was overwhelmed just seeing Everest for the first time because we've been a long time on the road waiting to get here. From about five miles away, we started to get a glimpse of it. So when we saw it for the first time properly, and it's just overwhelming. It takes your breath away, it really does. As soon as we came around the corner and seen this mountain, we knew straight away this was Everest because it just seems to be 10 times bigger than anything else. I've seen nothing like it in my life. Well, here we are. We've made it to base camp, Tibetan side, Chinese side. Just really happy to have made it here after the journey. Actually felt a lot better. Great journey, spectacular sights. Um, now we're here at base camp. Hope you can see everybody's just getting settled in as well. And then, as hopefully you can see in the background with a bit of cloud on it is Everest, which the peaks we've had of it so far I've been amazing. I can't wait till hopefully the cloud clears and we get a bit higher to look at it. But it's amazing. I think we're about 5,200 meters. And basically we have just spectacular views. And it's great. And uh, can't wait to get going, actually. I've seen a lot of mountains and I've, I've looked at them and thought, that's not too bad, that's not too bad. But when I saw Everest, I realized that you know this is going to be tough. It's definitely hit home now how difficult this is going to be. It's going to be interesting to see how it goes. You know, we still have to take it easy. Got a couple of small tracks to do before we even attempt the intermediate camp and then, um, then ABC. Uh, so I think we're going to find out very quickly how tough this really is going to be. Located under the face of Everest, at the edge of the Rongbuk Glacier, Base Camp is its own community. The vast collection of tents provides the basis of every successful climbing attempt up the northern side of the mountain but takes even the most seasoned of mountaineers a little getting used to. This is the inside of our tent at Everest Base Camp. And as you can see, I am an interior designer, so I have uh, made a few little alterations to make it feel nice. Well, we respect the Tibetan way of life here. They believe in the flags. They're important. They've got them hanging everywhere, all over the place. Uh, you'll find them all the way going up the mountain. We've, we've seen them all along the journey. And what it is, they, they say their prayers, they put the flags out and they blow in the wind. And what they believe is that the prayers are being blown to their gods. This big dome tent here, um, this is where we have all our meals. I wasn't expecting palm trees at Everest Base Camp, but it does make it feel a little bit special. I think it's most important to be able to somewhere that we feel safe, feel comfortable, where we can relax, we can start to appreciate where we really are. As well as hosting the group for all of their meals and meetings, the mess tent was also the scene of some of the team's more interesting bonding techniques. We're in our mess tent, which has become my salon. <laughs> Totally confident. Look at him. So Looks like a natural hairdresser. Jaw length? No. <laughs> Shoulder length? No. Okay. About here. Lovely. See, that's taken off about three inches at the back. Lovely. First cut's the deepest. Scissors aren't the best either. Wow, that's a lot you've cut off, isn't it? Now I'm going to do a bit of choppy choppy now to see how otherwise it's going to look like. This spaghetti. See, I think that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. But while spirits are high, the camp also provides a timely reminder of the dangers facing the team on the journey ahead. We're surrounded by sukras, which are monuments to people that have died up on Everest. There's a death zone up there. And sometimes we forget, we just look at a mountain. These people have given their lives for something they wanted to do. But it's still very, very sad. And it's poignant to see it. It makes me think how I think about my life and other people's lives. And I respect every single one of them. 
This is a hard, harsh, raw environment, and we can't forget it. We have to... Mother Nature has her own rules, and we have to obey them. With the team well and truly settled into camp, attention soon turned towards getting ready for the next stage of the challenge. What we're going to do is start taking a walk up towards intermediate camp. I think that's going to be the best move to let us get used to walking with each other as a team um, and just getting used to our altitude pace, uh, which is, as you know, quite a slow pace, yeah. So we want to get used to how we move as a team. The start of the journey was really getting on that plane. Coming to base camp, that felt like the start of the challenge. We're all itching now to actually get our boots on, get our walking poles out, and go into that wilderness of this beautiful mountain range. We can see it, we can feel it, we can touch it, but now we want to be in it. We start getting our acclimatisation walks in now to go higher, and it's a case of each day just trying to get a bit more height in. Very difficult to describe quite how difficult it is. Uh, and we're being at home, showing a lot of work with how slow we'd be walking. You just didn't believe me. Or well, I think we're probably about uh, 5,300 metres. As you know, our game's going to be at 6-7, so we've got a lot of adapting to do. We're walking on the glacier, which is amazing, but uh, my lungs are burning as well. The altitude's the one thing that's continuous, it keeps getting higher. And with that comes the obvious effects. So you've got a mixture of excitement, which is great, but then you've also got this sort of blended effect, I suppose is the word, which you're not prepared for, and sometimes that magnifies in a weird way. Altitude can be quite rough on the body. We know from our research that one in four people will get affected from altitude effects from as low as 2,500 meters. Altitude sickness is different from anything I've ever experienced. Uh, just, and I can't put into words how it is. It's not just being sick because you're drunk or being sick because you've got an upset tummy. It's, it's a very bizarre thing. It's like it catches your breath sometimes. Some, you could be almost doing nothing and find yourself suddenly out of breath for no reason at all. Or you've done something like as simple as bending over to put a shoe on and you get up with a bit of a head rush and massively out of breath. So it hits you at different times. Any small amount of activity has a maximum impact on it. And I, I guess as we go higher, that will become more and more apparent. And the effects were plain to see. With various members of the group unable to complete all three acclimatization walks, but it was one of the captains that had the most severe reaction. Well, during one of our training trips, Lee felt unwell, whereby he was short of breath. He became slightly dizzy. And at that point, I decided it would be a good idea to take him down myself. In hindsight, that turned out to be the best decision because he needed a specialized treatment whereby he was given specific medication that we use in situations like that. And he was also commenced on oxygen. You start off with a headache around the back, and then as the headache progresses, it starts to move around the front. And then as it gets to the front and in behind your eyes, it just shuts your body down. I was literally saying to the doc, you know, if I just leave me here, I'll have a cuddle and I'll just lie down. And, you know, that little rock or that yak over there looks really friendly, I'll stay here. You, you just can't function. It's very, very weird. Are you someone that worries? Are you worried about him, I suppose? Um... How do you handle that, that kind of anxiety as well? Um, I do worry. I worry for a living, I think. As long as I can get hold of him and just check in, then I worry a lot less. But he thrives on adventure, so, you know, I have to set my worries aside for that. That worry is well-founded, because despite being extremely fit, Lee needs to be more careful than most owing to a problem that brought a premature end to his rugby career. we just had Sonny, so Sonny was, I think, a week old, and he'd gone to London and he'd been told that he needed to get something checked out because it wasn't looking normal. And he just came home and said, I stop or um, something bad could happen. 
I had stopped quite suddenly with a heart issue. I've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hokum. Um, I've been checked out for this trip. It's an under revving heart, and uh, it just means that you know I can push my heart to sort of crazy limits. Um, but it could give me a yeah, it could give me a heart attack. That's how it's been described. I try not to think about it. Otherwise, I would just yeah, I wouldn't let him leave the house. So. Um, he assures me he's fine, and if he's worried, then I'm worried, and he's never worried about things. So, yeah, he just takes each day at a time. I think it's more that my doctor says it's OK, so I'm going to get on with it. But I think that will be a nagging thought. This is where I'm, I'm really interested to see when we get up there and the effects that altitude has on the mind. On the body, I know, you know, I'm pretty fit and we can all get through it, but from what I've heard, this is a real mental test. It's going to be interesting, but it will be when you're having those sort of tight chests and that tightness to breathe. I'll have got my oxygen meter and my heart rate monitor on and I'll be checking, but a lot of the times you've got to listen to your body, so I'll be doing that too, but not letting the monkey mind sabotage me. Nowadays it's so different. When he used to go to Australia, I used to write him a letter and I'd get one letter maybe a week, maybe two weeks, and now it's texts all the time and it's FaceTime. It's so much easier, but it's still, it's still a long time. And now with the boys, time's different to them, so Daddy being away for three weeks is, is, is an eternity for them, actually. Sometimes I used to put a little something in Lee's bag that he would find when he gets there, so something at the bottom. Um, I don't know what we'll put in, but we'll, we'll, we'll probably put a little something in to remember us. With Lee struggling on the mountainside, his family's surprise gifts were just what was needed to lift morale. I've got these close by my bed every day. I'll open them for you. The first one is uh, from Sonny, and he's got a picture of me. Um, I have to walk up Everest and then come down the other side to come home. Then we've also got uh, Felix. He's got a tank. Um, he's obviously seen the Chinese and Tibetan army around like we have. And then Isaac gave me a, this is what you'll look like. Pretty good, to be fair. He's actually given me long legs, so I'll take that. Whenever you do this kind of stuff, you, you know, I'm always thinking, am I setting my, uh, my kids a good example? Raising money for charity, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Whoever drew this one's got my bed on the side of the mountain. Um, my bed lower down a tunnel that I've got to dig so that I'm safe. A uh, little library. Uh, obviously, he's quite educated, Sonny. Yeah. And then a lovely letter from my good lady wife, which, is, uh, which will stay private. Otherwise, she'll beat me up. With various members of the group struggling, the expedition management were forced to make a difficult choice. The decision to play at base camp was actually a tough decision because what we wanted to do was play it as high an altitude as we possibly could because it, so it couldn't be broken in the future. Some of the guys just physically weren't going to make it. One of our team captains, despite being one of the fittest people here, bar none, just struggled with the altitude. So we made the decision to play down here at base camp, which still breaks the world record by a long shot, which is amazing. The whole ethos we try to push out throughout this is that we are a team and we do everything together as a team. We want everyone to go back to the UK as Guinness World Record holders, hold their head high because they deserve it. The pitch is 70 metres by. 50, which is slightly different to the pitch we're going to set out higher up. We're just marking out the uh, important lines, which are the dead ball, the try line, 22, halfway line. The first time I've actually marked up a pitch. I think we're doing OK. I think Rob's kind of calculated it all right. It does look quite rectangular. <laughs> it looks a bit wide for my leg, eh? I think it's a lot of pitch to cover for, for six players, considering we're at... Is it 5,200 metres altitude? Mix, touch rugby. Good luck, guys. The flags were up, the lines were laid. All that was needed were the players. But before the match kicked off, they gathered as one to mark a special occasion. Gang, it's a pretty special day today. We're going to set a Guinness World Record, but even more importantly, someone's birthday in this group. Yeah. Yeah. Within tradition, I think we should sing happy birthday to our very own Leslie. So, three, two, one. Happy birthday to you. 
In order for the match to count as a new world record, it had to meet a strict criteria. Played on a full-size pitch under all touch rugby laws. And it didn't take long for the birthday girl to make an impact. I've been watching Shane Williams do the jig, so I did a little bit of a jig around uh, Rob Calloway, and he didn't stand a chance. He got my first try, my first game. With the match in full swing, what followed was a surprisingly fierce competition, as both sides overcame the lack of oxygen and tricky playing conditions to end the contest even on the scoreboard. We've just uh, played the highest game of touch rugby in history and it's ended up in an honourable draw. It's been a long time in the planning, you know, more than a year. Touch rugby on Everest. Fantastic. What a great view we've got up here. Everest in the background. There's no better stadium in the world than that. It was a big relief to actually get here and get it done. On a personal level, I'm just delighted that everybody's managed to make it to base camp and how we've got a group here of you know, 26 people who've never really met each other before and we've pulled off, well, pulled off the impossible. This has never been done before. This is a, a Guinness World Record that we set today and it's absolutely amazing, but we need to make sure that everyone's fit and ready because we uh, head out tomorrow morning, heading up to the intermediate base camp and then up to advanced base camp. A key part of the expedition management was volunteer James O'Malley, a leadership expert with a background in the armed forces. My name is James O'Malley. I'm the CEO of Fusion Community Initiatives, partner of Wooden Spoons, a children's rugby charity. My family are used to me coming up with crazy ideas and uh, the Good Ideas Club is what it's known as a lot of the time. My wife kind of rolled her eyes when I said I'm going to climb an Everest and then I'm going to be part of the leadership team as well. My kids think it's uh, an amazing thing that I'm doing and a lot of my friends have been extremely supportive. My mum uh, doesn't want to know anything about it till I get back, <laughs> which is uh, pretty much the way she was throughout my military career as well. So that's fine, that's just her way of dealing with it. And uh, yeah, we'll all get back safe. I worked in uh, operational combat zones throughout the world and humanitarian relief as well. Served Iraq, Afghanistan, finished up in um, Somalia doing counter-piracy for the EU, and then I was the EU lead medical planner for the Ebola crisis. So um, I've had a very varied career. And one of the key things I wanted to do when I left the military was to make a difference. I wanted to change the world, <laughs> which might sound cheesy, but uh, I believe that we can all change the world just by doing one good thing a day. And that's why we came up with the concept of doing these sort of projects and trying to make a difference in the world. One thing we found throughout the world, whether you're in a combat zone or a humanitarian relief effort, children are the same. That's why we decided uh, we wanted to work with children's charities. And I've got a, a nephew, Harvey, who's an absolutely amazing child with cerebral palsy. And I see the struggles that his mum and dad go through and his older brother, Joe. And uh, if we can help children like that to have a better quality of life, why not? When you leave the military, you, you miss that adrenaline sometimes. So having something to replace that adrenaline maybe is one of the main drivers for me. But also the work that Wooden Spoon do, I think is absolutely amazing. And when they came to us to be a partner, it was absolute no brainer. We want to change children's lives. We want to make a difference in this world. And if we can do that through rugby at the same time, which I'm massively passionate about, um, yeah, why wouldn't we? As the sun set on the first world record attempt, final preparations began for the group's big push up the mountain. So tomorrow, it is going to be a big day, yeah? When we went up the first time, um, we took about three hours to get halfway. So, you know, you need to get your heads in order to know it's going to be a big day tomorrow. And we'll all be feeling it. And then the next day, unfortunately, it's another big day, but I think you can all do it, but you need to just get your brains switched off, OK? No one person is going to get themselves up to that mountain, play the game and back down by themselves. It's just a fact. Without everyone supporting each other, physically and emotionally, we're going to have to work as a tight team. We're all going up there as one unit. We're going to complete it as one unit, come down safely as one unit. So it's 9.30. On the 26th of April, we finally set off, heading for intermediate camp. Now, the real challenge begins. 
heading up to advanced base camp over the next two days, jumping up 1400 meters. Should be an absolute cracker. When the day finally came for us to set off to advanced base camp with the interlude of a break at intermediate camp, I knew that was going to be the acid test for us as a group. It was what we signed up for. And I thought at the time it would either make or break us as a group. The group were forced to leave four of their number behind as they left base camp, and it didn't take long for altitude to strike again. Jody's made the decision that he's not going to go any further. He's got an awful chest infection, and he's dug in the control by fairness, but that's enough. I knew how much it meant to him. I knew how hard he worked on this one to be able to adapt and manage the altitude, and I think, and he'd done that. And it was cruel for him to have been dealt the blow of a chest infection that ultimately ruled him out from reaching the top. And I, I knew this was the big one for him. With another man down, the challengers were forced to refocus and push on with the gruelling road ahead. We started at 5,200 metres. I think the walk was seven miles long and we had to get to 5,800 metres. I didn't get any muscle fatigue, really, because we move so slowly, because you literally can't get the oxygen to your muscles. So your legs don't ache like they do after you know, a normal training session, but you just feel tired and drained. We were told by the doctor that after 5,500 metres, your body doesn't adapt and you're just dying, really. It was just relentless, up, down, up, down, up, down, over these, like, hillock things. It was really cool, because um, we got to go really close to a glacier and walked along the edge of like a, a frozen lake. A couple of people at the back where I was were struggling, so we were walking pretty slowly and just trying to kind of pace each other. It's been a tough day. We're not even there yet. I think we've got like a mile and a half, mile to go. And it's, it's the toughest day yet. Uh, for me personally, I've had a headache, banging headache for the last four miles. Um, it hasn't been easy. I think we've been, you know, Intermediate camps just across the way. You can't quite see, but we were able to see some tents earlier on. But then we were told that it, that wasn't actually intermediate camp, so it's tough. I was confident of getting myself there. I was more concerned about other people getting there as well and getting enough people up there to make the game of rugby sevens work. So, of course, we need 15 people uh, to to make that work. I, I wasn't certain that was going to happen. There were people dropping out, feeling sick, injured. Some people were not going to make it. So that was pretty nerve wracking. Final stretch into intermediate camp. You really go down into this valley and then come back up the top to the tent. So one last. Push on the hills. People are really tired. It's been a long day. The impact that it had on the group was enormous. You could see just how heavy and hard it was hitting people, even at the halfway point. So psychologically, mentally, that was a big hurdle for people to overcome. We got to intermediate camp and there was yaks sort of scattered around some tents that we, we thought might be ours, but we weren't sure. And we walked into this really small mess tent. People were practically sat on top of each other. Most people ate a tiny bit and then went to their very comfortable tents, which were balanced on the hillside with rocks underneath them. Knowing that we were going higher than we'd ever been before the next day, I went to sleep hoping to be able to get some sleep and breathe through the night, get warm, stay warm, and then try and push on the next day. But it did become slightly worrying, I think, really, the night before we pushed on to advanced base camp. Another member of the group was unable to go further, so descended back to base camp. As the rest of the team rallied for a second day of pushing themselves harder than ever before. Because our goal was to get to advanced base camp, everybody wanted to get there. You just kind of put your head down and whether it hurt or whether you couldn't breathe or whether you doubted yourself, you just had to carry on. And I think everybody had that same mentality. Most people, I think, at some point in that second day probably struggled. Walking very slow, as you can tell. I reckon we're about 5'9". Uh, we left intermediate base camp. We are walking on a glacier. It is amazing scenery. It's exhausted. But you, you can't explain how slow we have to walk. Uh, the trick is not to get out of breath. But as you can see, uh, 
that's not really possible. So the day's just going to get progressively harder. You're out of breath. Every step you've got to decide to make the step, push yourself, and I'll show you the people moving. That's how fast they're moving or stopping. You've got Dino at the front there. He's typical of the group. It's just exhausting. The true acid test came with the fact that the sun then dropped behind the mountain around 4, 4.30. We were still a good two and a half hours from camp. And I could see from body language that people were so close to breaking. And I knew we were in a bit of trouble. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get my legs to move. It was just the most surreal and frustrating situation I think I've ever been in. They were talking about getting me some oxygen, talking about radioing ahead and seeing if they could get us some help. And in the end, two of the Sherpas came down and I literally had two Sherpas as crutches and they took me the last kind of 300 metres up to the uh, medical tent at Advance Base Camp. She dug so, so deep to get to this camp to finish it off. It was a dark time, but also one of those uplifting moments. So when you get there and you realise what you've all overcome, it was a euphoric moment. It was an emotional moment for definite, but just so delighted that, you know, 21 of us are now here at Advanced Base Camp, which, to be honest, was the hardest challenge of them all. Stretching his limits is nothing new for Captain Ollie Phillips. The 36-year-old former England Seven star has regularly been challenging himself since injury forced his retirement in 2013. The plan was to do a World Cup in, in Moscow, then go to the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, and then have a two-year run up to Rio. And then, unfortunately, I got injured and that was it, game over. I, you know, I'd severed the nerve in my calf and, and I was told that I had to retire. Uh, and that was, you know, some dark days, some tough days. But thankfully, through rugby, I met loads of amazing people. And one of them was a bloke called Sir Robin Knox Johnson. And he sort of suggested, do you want to do the Clipper race? And, uh, and, and it sort of went from there. And I never forget, I cycled all the way to Brussels. Got to Brussels, celebrated my birthday that evening, and the next morning I flew to Brest. Got into Brest at half past 10 in the evening and then jumped on the GB boat and set off to sail around the world. That was how it all sort of came about. Uh, and then came back 11 months later, 46,000 miles later, having never sailed before, but now had fully circumnavigated the globe. Loads of other challenges came. I cycled across America. We've climbed a few mountains in between that. Mont Blanc and uh, uh, Kilimanjaro and other ones. Now, there's this hunger inside me to do stuff that sort of pushes my boundaries. And the wooden spoon had got in contact with me and they said, look, you know, we're going to try and do this North Pole game. Would you be up for it? And I think the biggest learning from all of it was yeah, if people go off on their own, do their own thing, a, they're going to get themselves into trouble, and B, they're going to get the group into trouble. Stay together, work together. You know, after this trip to Everest, I know there are going to be 26 people who I can see when I'm 76 and say, do you remember that time when we did this challenge? That's what I love. I love the fact that there's always going to be that connection. Life is about stories, and the more you can have, you know, the better. Under the face of Everest, the group were recovering from the effort of reaching advanced base camp. But it wasn't long before thoughts turned towards their final world record attempt. Good morning, this is day two at advanced base camp. I've woken up alongside my delightful little princess. Morning. There he is, look at him. And Robin, tell us what's the day got in store for us today? The small groupers are going to the proposed pitch site to inspect it. We've got to go there to make sure it's a playable surface. There's a risk of crevasses. So we've got to walk the length of the pitch and uh, make sure that there's nothing significant danger to us. The glacier underneath camp was identified as probably the highest place on Earth with a space big enough and flat enough for a rugby pitch. But it wasn't without risk. We're actually on the pitch now and we're searching for crevasses. We rope together. As you can see in front, we're just trying to do a complete scan of the pitch. We've all walked up and down it now uh, three times. It's deep snow, very tiring. Uh, I don't know how we're going to play. It's a killer just walking, but this is how we're checking for crevasses. I can't speak anymore. It's too tiring. With the surface deemed safe to play on, 
it was full steam ahead as the group looked to make history. So Guinness World Record insisted that we had a regulation pitch and it ran for the right amount of time, it had the right number of people. So it was just a regular match, really. It's just a, what you might do on a Saturday or Sunday, organising a match at your local community club, but a little bit more thinking and operational uh, logistics behind the scenes. The whole party joined in setting out the pitch, putting tape down and erecting the post. You know, everyone's tired, resting and leaning on shovels and then doing a bit and doing a bit more. But it went well, it was a real team effort to get it ready. The game is the recognition of the effort that has gone in from everybody here and everybody at home. You know, it's the record in the history books that signifies the effort of 28 incredible people. Not all, unfortunately, have managed to make it here and be part of, but they are here with us, spiritually, emotionally, if you like. But to be here at Advanced Base Camp, to be at 6,400 metres with the preparation that people have had is quite frankly extraordinary. And to then go out and set this Guinness World Record, I defy anyone else to try and beat that. In fact, if I'm honest, I don't think anyone will ever beat that. Look, guys, we've worked really hard to get up here. We really have. We lost people along the way, and uh, th this is part of, you know, part of, of them as well. Um, one thing I will say is that it'd be great to go home with a Guinness record, having won the game as well, wouldn't it? Let's go out there, have a load of fun, enjoy it. The best 14 minutes of our lives, OK? We've got Everest as the backdrop, OK? Everyone's worked so hard to be here. Let's have a great time, all right? Yeah, of course. In the middle. Three, two, one, spoon, OK? Three, two, one, spoon! Come on, boys. We kicked off within probably a minute and a half. Half the people playing were sat down, just exhausted. You know, you just chase one ball for five metres, pick it up, try and run and pass it, and then you have to sit down. It's like running around with a plastic bag on your head. It's just impossible. It wasn't the fastest game I've ever played in, but there was a couple of decent bits of rugby. I think everyone was a bit stressed that there weren't going to be any tries because by the time we'd set the pitch up, People were really, really tired. So I was thinking, oh, this might actually be a nil-nil game that's really, really slow. And then obviously Ollie Phillips got his hands on the ball and ran for the line. I think, again, people were shouting at him, telling him to go under the posts. I don't think he cared. He just put the ball down and then I was telling him he needed to kick the ball. <laughs> he needed to try and go for a conversion. And he honestly looked at me like he wanted to punch me in the face. Um, but I was so far away from the try line having called the try that he was never going to get to me, so I was OK. With Ollie Phillips' team leading at half-time, one man in particular was determined to avoid being on the losing side. Now, there's a line-out, and I think a loose ball came, dropped onto the floor, just a perfect place for me to pick up. I started walking, then scurried on a bit and probably ran 10 metres. People are shouting at me to go into the post, but didn't have the energy. I just put the ball down to score, and then instantly felt like I was suffocating, so I ripped my headgear off, took, spat my gum shield out, took my rugby shirt off, and just lay on the floor, panting like a dog, really exhausted. It was horrific. Ollie scored the first try, share attempt with him, so I was against him. I wanted to make sure that the game was at least a draw, which it was. Blew the final whistle and I looked around and again, it was like something out of a war scene. People were just on the floor, some people were hugging. So hard, so hard. <sighs> Just, no way. so oh, but We did it! Yay! We got the record. I think everyone was just like, number one, relieved. Thank God she's finally blown the whistle. And number two, can't believe we've done it. At the end of the day, we played the highest game of rugby union. But we raised a huge amount of money for children. <laughs> we would never get this opportunity. <laughs> Rugby in unusual places is special, you know. Rugby's in our veins, and uh, I didn't think that when I joined Wooden Spoon four years ago that uh, I would have uh, been part of an amazing group of people that have played this game at this altitude. Three 